What's going on, world? Welcome back to another edition of the Black Mental Health Podcast. I'm your host, Reg. Joined today with me is a newlywed. <laughs> um, just got married, but also can offer some great insight into this world of mental health. Simone, I'll introduce people. I want to make sure we get all them credentials out there so the people can pick, perk the ears up and know why they're listening. So please tell the people who you are and some about some of what you do. Okay, cool. Hi, everybody. My name is Simone, newly Simone Waples. Um, Simone Sims Riley on all of my credentials. Uh, so I am a master's level uh, psychotherapist. Um, I have two master's degrees, a master's in mental health counseling and a master's um, in clinical psychology. And then I am in my fourth year of uh, my doctoral program. So I'll be getting a doctorate of psychology and clinical psychology as well. Um, I go to the Philadelphia College of Osteopathic Medicine for my doctorate. Also received both of my masters there. Um, yeah, I work with uh, various uh, age groups and various disorders: uh, anxiety, depression, ADHD. Um, I have some experience now doing some autism testing. Um, so many things there's, there's so there's too many things to remember like, it's just so much i could do so many things no nah, i got you i was looking for my phone because it had my notes but I, this is a real freestyle now but <laughs> <laughs> um if it ring i'll go and grab it but if not we just gonna rock and roll so um for starters like you you just named a lot of things that you're doing right mm. um th- is this what you saw when you were younger when you said all right this is what i want to do when i get older um, super young, no. I just knew that I was going to be a cop <laughs> or a lawyer. <laughs> like, I, I learned my Miranda rights very early on. Um, and then when I was 14, I went to therapy myself mm. um, with two clinical psychologists. I was like a part of um, a research study at CHOP. And I just had such a wonderful experience with them. And I was like, this is what I want to do. You know, I think uh, when people get into therapy, it's always like the cliche, like people love talking to me and, you know, <laughs> I, they always come to me to solve their problems. And, you know, I had that experience and then I went to therapy myself and I was like, you know what, this is, this is what I want to do. So since 14, I've been on the, the grind to become a clinical psychologist and I have not stopped. Now, I would ask you uh, what led you to go to therapy, but you said you were younger at that age. So was it like, did your parent put you in or was it recommended or mandated? Um, Not mandated, but my parents did involve me. I had um, just like some mental health issues at 14 with a lot of just being bullied um, and struggling with, uh, with that experience. And so they got me involved in treatment. And I think might have been like 12 weeks of therapy and it was just great it was like individual and family therapy like my parents were involved as well um and just talking about my experiences and getting some skills to not only help myself but to also like help my parents help me too um and improve our relationship as well and I was like damn this is dope this is very (laughs) helpful this is nice (laughs) um I haven't talked about that often, so I'm glad you brought it up. Um, well, it's two things. I'm hopefully I can remember both, but um, bullying and and the 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 thought process around it for mm-hmm. for both the bullier and the one that's being and the person, the individual who is being bullied, like as in in your practice and 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 in treatment plans and dealing with that. Can you speak to both sides of the of the mindset and if like how you can help either or how you can help both of them? Um, yes. Yeah. So to start with the bullier, um, I feel like a lot of that is learned. It's, it's always learned behavior, right? So they are seeing this in some way, shape or form, either at home or in their community or environment. Um, and they may have themselves been bullied in you know, school or on the playground or something. And so in my mind and how I conceptualize things, it's like either you become the thing that is being like done to you or you say to yourself, I don't want to be that way. So I'm going to, you know, choose another route. Mm. And so for the bullyers, like they're the ones that are like, well, this is being done to me and I don't like it. And I feel like the only way to stop it is for me to become a bully or to make myself feel better. 
I'm going to do the same thing to somebody else. Um, and again, just it's just all learned behavior. They might see their parent doing that to other people. Their parent might be doing it to them. Their siblings might be doing it to them. And then they go into, you know, another environment and they engage in that behavior. Um, and it could also be just some misplaced um, or misdirected anger or other emotional concerns where they don't have the the ability to communicate what it is that they're experiencing internally. And so they are externalizing their experience. And unfortunately, it's getting externalized to, you know, people that they feel won't, you know, harm them in any way or will be less likely to stick up for themselves. Um, when it comes to the, the child that's being bullied, um, it's just a matter of like who, who will, be the weakest, I guess, and who won't say something um, to somebody that's bullying them and, you know, their willingness to stick up for themselves or somebody to stick up for them and, you know, like come to their rescue. And it's just unfortunate, you know, for the child being bullied that like you're the person that gets picked for that experience and you do your best to manage that in the moment. But, you know, of course, you know, they tell us, you know, if you're, you know, if you're being bullied, like, don't show weakness, you know, don't cry, and like, you know, bully him back, fight back, mm -hmm. and teaching your kids how to play the dozens and all that, and it's just <laughs> like, it just becomes a lot, like, mm -hmm. and, and as a kid, I was somebody who, I was very, like, sensitive, and I don't know, I want to say sensitive, my way to express my emotions was to cry, mm -hmm. and it still is to this day, and it's like any little thing that like made me emotionally upset, I'm gonna cry about it. And so I was an easy target for bullying because mm. I'm gonna cry. I'm not gonna say nothing back to you. We're not about to play the dozens. I'm not going to fight you. I'm just gonna sit here and ball my eyes out and hope that somebody's gonna say, what's wrong? I tell them what's wrong and then they do something about it. Mm. Um, and so that's just the, that's my conceptualization of bullying experiences. No, and I, 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 I'm, I'm hopefully that uh, I'm not harping on it too much because I know you said it was an experience and, and they go back to being a trigger. Um, but um, I just think about all those kids and I'll, I'll speak about for myself. So I'm, I'm, I'm very careful of that fine line of um, I got two sons, very careful of that fine line of showing my son, like teaching him discipline. Um, Cause I don't beat or do anything like that, but just discipline, like, Hey, do this, like making sure he's disciplined versus being like, almost like bullying him into doing things, just trying mm -hmm. to get him into doing it. It's a fine line. Um, I think about those kids that their parents are their first bullies. And you know what I mean? Like they, they, they get it at home and how they almost have to like, how do you cope with that at home when your parents are the bullies or your guardians or the people that you're living with are the bullies? Like, how do you even, you know, when you work with children, like, help them in that capacity? Um, one thing I can say is I haven't come across that, thank God. Um, but I think that is something that's really hard to cope with, especially as a child, because as children, you are a blank slate, pretty much. And so you don't really know how to appropriately express your emotions and to cope with those things. And so, again, that's why they turn to bullying other kids, because it's like, well, I don't know what else to do with mm. this frustration and this anger and this sadness, right? Because how, as my parent, are you bullying me when you're supposed to be the one that's loving and nurturing me? Um, and so what I would say that if I did come across that, uh, one, you know, I'm going to work with the child to teach them how to express their emotions and their experiences in those situations and making sure that, you know, there's no physical uh, violence happening towards them because that's going to be extremely important if it is. And it's like, we might need to have you removed from the home or figure out something else. Um, but I think just teaching them how to appropriately communicate their experiences, what their thoughts are, what their feelings are. A lot of kids lack um, an emotional vocabulary. Uh, and they may know like happy, sad, and, and angry, but there's so many different feelings that somebody can experience. And if all you got is those three, that's not enough. And we need you to know more and we need you to be able to communicate that effectively to other people. Um, and then encouraging them, you know, identifying who in their environment um, do they feel safe, you know, speaking to. If it, if it can't be a parent, do they have an older sibling? Um, who they can, you know, share that experience with. And I hate for them to trauma bond over that experience, but like 
being able to express like, you know, it really hurts me when, you know, dad yells at me and like tells me that I'm never going to be anything and I'm like terrible. Um, or when my mom says, you know, blah, blah, blah. And then other people outside of the home. So if you have any mentors, if you have uh, peers, um, and I try not to say peers because other children like shouldn't have that that placed on them. Um, but sometimes your peers can be somebody that you can go to if you're experiencing that and just hold space for you in that way. Um, teachers at school, some most of these schools have counselors nowadays. So talking to the counselor as well. Um, it's hard to like get children into therapy because they need their parents' um, permission to do it uh, if they are under 16. And so um, parents would have to be involved. And if your parent is the bully, well, what's their experience with therapy? What are their thoughts on therapy? And when I work with uh, children, especially under a certain age, I'm working with the parents too. So there's information that parents are, are going to be privy to and aware of, of what we're doing. And if that's going to cause friction, more friction in the household, like we got to work on that. And if parents are willing um, to be a part of that process, you know, teaching them skills, a lot of these parents don't have proper parenting skills to like really effectively parent. So maybe like they need to have some skills, you know, to improve their communication with their children. Um, and sometimes they may be oblivious to the fact that their behaviors and their communication is a form of bullying. Like they just might think like, oh, I'm just being like a tough parent or like giving tough love. And it's like, no, it's just kind of bordering on the line of you're doing too much. Um, and so just kind of giving them education on how to better communicate with their children, working with them together in therapy too, to practice developing the, the appropriate way to communicate with your child and your child's ability to communicate with you and recognizing like your kid can say, you know, I don't, I don't like the way that you're speaking to me or I don't like what you, what you said there, what you did there and being okay with that and rearranging, you know, what you're doing so that the, the relationship, you know, is, is strong. Mm. and it's helpful no and you said a lot it was in there hopefully i can remember all the questions <laughs> i usually write my notes right. down but um the one of the questions that i had when you were speaking and you gave a lot about it but i just wanted to make sure i like hone in on that point um especially as adult children um where you you uh you said early on that your your, your mom your parents came to therapy with you you know at that mm -hmm. age but that's a a fortunate situation where a lot of people don't yeah. have that opportunity so as a kid not only as a kid but also as an adult where all right there are experiences that um i received from my parents not personally but you know just received in general from that parent where you will want them to go to family therapy and their dynamics that um me and my sister talk about it all the time about actually like about like we wish that we can have a full conversation openly with him but we know they're not going to be authentically themselves in mm -hmm. the space how do you what do you say to that child that doesn't you know the adult child or the you know minor who doesn't have the fortunate pleasure of getting their 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 their, their parent to come to the therapy process with them um what I would say is that, you know, we're going to work on what we can work on. And I'm going to give you the, the skills that I can to make sure that you're able to, again, effectively communicate your experiences, your thoughts and your feelings and behave based on those thoughts and feelings in a way that's going to be adaptive. Um, and that's going to help you. And, you know, apologize for the fact that that is your experience, you know, because it's, it's really hard to affect change when the people in your environment also need to change. It's like, you can't be the only person changing when everybody got some things with them. Like, it's just not going to work. <laughs> it's not going to work. <laughs> and, um, and it's just unfortunate. And I've had that experience with, um, I've had that experience with a lot of my adult clients. Where it's like, you know, their parents clearly need to change. Their parents could benefit from a session or two with someone. It don't got to be me, but with somebody, right. they could benefit. And I'm like, there's really nothing that we can do. I'm like, because what we don't want to do is force somebody into therapy, right? Because when you're forced into therapy, you are not going to show up as your authentic self because you don't want to be there. You're going to say what you feel like, you know, needs to be said so that you don't have to come back and you're going to like go through the motions, but learn nothing. 
Um, and so the best that I can do is just give you the skills that will help you while you're in that environment, while you're in this situation. And then once you're removed from that situation, if anything, you're going to come out a lot better because now you have the skills to be a, a, an appropriately functioning individual. Mm. Talk to me about emotional vocabulary. You said it about like children, but it, these children becomes adults who don't have that same emotional vocabulary. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. Um, what are your thoughts around it? And like, what does that look like for a person that is uh, obtaining the emotional vocabulary? Because I just learned about the feelings will and um, yes. utilizing that and like really checking yes. in with myself and using more of the the deeper emotion connected and not just like, yeah, I'm cool. I'm straight. I'm all right. Like, like what is the, all right, what is the cool? What is the straight? So mm-hmm. talk to me about that. The feelings wheel is my favorite thing. <laughs> I pull it up <laughs> for my clients on her. This is probably my favorite thing about virtual sessions is the fact that I can share a screen so fast. <laughs> and I ain't gotta be like, where are my papers at? I just like, I know exactly what folder, what picture, blah, blah, blah. And I pull up that feelings wheel, like give me every emotion that you experience. And building an emotional vocabulary is just what it sounds like. It's being able to identify all of the feelings that you're experiencing in a given moment and recognizing that it's more than just being happy, sad, or angry. Mm. Like it's it's disappointed, it's disgust, mm. it's surprised, it's joyful, it's you know, excited, um, it's rage, right? And Understanding that one experience doesn't mean that you're only going to experience, there we go, um, doesn't mean that you're only going to experience one emotion, right? So, for example, um, you know, I am in the process of uh, finishing up like my curriculum and my SID program, and then we're going to move on to internship in the summertime, right? So I got a lot of emotions going on. Like I am confident, I'm ecstatic, I'm optimistic, but I'm also scared. (laughs) Like I'm overwhelmed. Mm. I feel a little bit insecure. And it's like being able to express that there are going to be situations that create a lot of emotions, but you got to be able to communicate that and not only communicate it, but understand why that that's happening. And so um, I am a train, I'm trained in cognitive behavioral therapy. I'm also certified in cognitive behavioral therapy. Um, And so with cognitive behavioral therapy, the kind of the basis of that model is that your thoughts, feelings, and behaviors all interact with each other in any given situation. And so normally you'll have a thought about a situation and that thought is what's triggering your emotion, right? And so one thought could have a bunch of emotions attached to it, or you have so many thoughts about it that you got so many emotions attached to it. And you gotta be able to parse out what's happening in those moments. Um, And again, that is a skill that has to be developed. It does not happen just because. Um, And that's where therapy comes in, is like teaching you how to develop that skill set. And so just kind of walking clients through that feelings will and and giving that to them and introducing that to them is like, what else are you feeling? You know, what what thought did that bring up for you? All right, well, which thought was the most distressing? All right, well, tell me all of the emotions that came with that one thought. And let's talk about it. How, and I give percentages for the emotions, right? So like how on a scale of zero to 100, how much were you feeling, you know, sad? How much were you feeling disgusted? How much were you feeling disappointed? How much were you feeling lonely? And we were we working through why you even got to that point and understanding how other similar experiences have gotten to a point where you're experiencing all those emotions. You spoke on trauma bonding earlier, right? And I, you know, in in and just hearing the word, you can kind of understand what it means but what's the clinical like what's the experience behind trauma bonding what's the the background you know information behind trauma bonding um I will be so honest and say that my clinical knowledge of trauma bonding is not very strong I just hear you know there's buzzwords on Mm -hmm. social media and (laughs) um so trauma bonding is like one of those like buzzwords you know happening right now Mm -hmm. um and essentially it's just like we are developing 
um, a relationship based on our like shared experiences of trauma. Like we might've been through like a similar trauma together. And like, that is how we are developing this relationship, right? Because we, we have been through so many traumatic experiences that it's like, oh my God, we like, we're twin flames because like mm. we've been through the same type of traumas. It's like, no, 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 no. <laughs> That's not why we're twin flames. Is it, is it okay to like be able to develop a relationship where you're able to empathize with someone um, because you have been through a similar experience? Yes. That's kind of how you develop friendships. It's like we have so many similarities. However, that should not be the basis, the foundation of your relationship with somebody. Mm. Because if anything, it's kind of like a breeding ground for more trauma. It's like, that's all we got in common is the fact that like we were, you know, experienced child abuse in our, in our childhood. And like, this has resulted in us like being in, in, you know, abusive relationships with multiple people and in multiple environments where we're working in a toxic work environment where our boss is talking to us all types of crazy and our coworkers are being rude to us. And then, you know, our interpersonal relation or, or romantic relationships where, you know, our partner is verbally abusing us and physically abusing us. There may be some type of sexual abuse going on that, you know, and it's like, that's why we're connecting with each other because we are having so much hurt. And it's like, I could talk to somebody about my hurt and like, I know for a fact that they gonna understand where I'm coming from and they can really empathize with me. Uh, that's just so unhealthy. Mm. Like it's, it's okay if that's, if you have somebody that again, can empathize with the trauma, but that should not be the foundation of your relationship with that person. The only things that y'all have in common is the fact that, and like the way that you coped with the trauma too. Like, it should be like, yeah, girl, I was, I was avoiding all of that. Yup. Mm-hmm. Me too, girl. How'd you avoid it? I just went on vacations. Me too. And it's like, what? I went shopping. I gambled. You know, I was promiscuous or, you know, I was doing drugs and I, I drink and now we out every, you know, night drinking until we black out drunk and doing all types of drugs and whatever else to escape the realities of our traumas and it's like not not a good foundation for the <laughs> at all at all as we as we talk about uh certain things like you said buzzwords on social media right what do you mm-hmm. feel is missing from the conversation and around wellness and mental health since there's been such an awakening around it? Like, what do you see? Like, I wish people would like talk more about X, Y, and Z as opposed to like just putting out almost like misinformation. Yeah. Um, I wish that, I would say that there's a good mixture finally of like people putting out proper information, but they might not be like explaining it in the proper clinical way. So it's like, it's a great introduction to things. So like, you know, oh, this is what anxiety is. It's not just, you know, freaking out or it's not just being angry. Like, no, anxiety can look like blah, blah, blah. And I was like, that's great. It's proper information. But then it's like the, maybe the hacks to like, oh, you can get over your anxiety if you just do blah, 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 blah. And it's like, nah. Not really. There's more to it than that, but mm. that could be helpful. But there, there's more than just that. And making people think that they can replace therapy with these hacks that are on TikTok and that are on Instagram. It's like, no, those things can be helpful. But at the end of the day, you still need to process through how you even got in this position in the first place. And then learning appropriate and more effective and um, empirically based skills to help you through it. Another thing that I see a lot of is assessments. Um, it's, not a, it's not a lot of talk about like what psychological assessments are and how they can be helpful. What it is a lot of talk of is, especially in our community, is that like, don't get your kids assessed they just want to like put these labels on these black kids and these black boys and they just want them to have ADHD so that they can put them on medication and blah, blah, blah. and it's like actually no there are now there are some people who will refer for um a, an assessment because like they feel like medication is going to be a simple you know solution to the problem 
However, assessments are actually the things that one can help us identify what exactly is going on with a person, child or an adult, but two, they can get the resources that they need so that they can function. Mm -hmm. um, and then it's like having an assessment and having a diagnosis, is like this negative like thing on your record. Like I was listening to a radio show and they were like, yeah, like they wanted to diagnose my son with uh, ADHD and like that's going to be on his record forever. And I'm like, what record? Who is looking at the record? Where are they getting the record from? Because there are only a certain amount of people who have access to that information. So what record are you talking about? And why is it such a negative thing? And, and I guess just in the, our, you know, the African-American community and other communities, like having a mental health diagnosis is so stigmatized. But it's like the diagnosis is going to be the thing that is actually going to help us give recommendations so that they can thrive in school, they can thrive at work, they can thrive in their regular lives without struggling with the fact that they can't pay attention, without struggling with the fact that like they need to move. Like there are a lot of people that can sit still for hours at a time. I'm one of them. I can sit still. I don't need to move around and jump around and all that jazz. But there are other people who can't do that. Yes. The chair and, swinging and <laughs> exactly. And it's like, and, and that's okay. It doesn't mean like that you're like inefficient or like that you're like problematic. It just means that there are going to be some things that we're going to have to implement in your daily routine and in your daily life to make sure that again you can function appropriately in any setting and your life doesn't have to be made hard for no good reason. Can you talk more about that list, though? Because I don't think I ever asked that question because there was a conversation like back in the day where I don't know if they talk about it no more because, again, everybody's talking about mental health and mental wellness now. But one a part of the stigma was like, hey, you could they, that's going to be almost like it's just like in school when they say, hey, you can't do stuff. It'll be on your permanent record. It's like, mm -hmm. hey, you don't want to get diagnosed. I don't even know where the permanent record thing is at, but <laughs> that's what I'm talking about. <laughs> Who has access to what is this permanent record that you speak of and who's looking at it? <laughs> <laughs> they said the same thing with like being diagnosed or going to therapy or going something else it was hey you don't want to do that because it may prevent you from getting a job it may, it may it may get it may prevent you from like everybody's looking at getting houses it was always like a big stigma around that is there some truth to that like where did that even start is that one of those black myths it is a myth <laughs> it is listen to me clearly it's a myth there is Here's the thing. So let's say you go to outpatient therapy, right? The only people that have access to that information is your therapist. If you're using your insurance company, your insurance company, and they don't even have full access to that information. The note that they get is very simple. We're, we're not giving every single thing, you know, mm. that said in session to the insurance company. It's you and it's whoever you signed a release of information for. And in the event that you want to harm or kill yourself, harm or kill anyone else, or if, so, if for some reason I am subpoenaed by a judge to bring your records through, and again, they may not get every single thing that is in your record. They get what is necessary based on the question. Those are the only people that have access to that information. It ain't going to stop you from getting a job. It's not going to stop you from buying a house, a car. It won't stop you if you wanted to adopt a baby. It ain't mm -hmm. going to stop that. Because uh, again, unless it is requested and you as the client have to provide a release of information. And even still with that release of information, they are not going to get every single thing that you have talked about in the session. They get what is necessary. What are you asking for? This is the basic information that I'm going to give you. We're going to give you the most basic information. Basic. And unless you need like a letter for, you know, work because you, you called out or you need like an FMLA letter or something or you say like, oh, I'm sick because of my mental health or whatever. And they like, oh, you need a letter to come back. Even that is going to very minimal information very minimal. It might include your diagnosis. That's the most that it's going to say. But I'm not about to sit here and be like, yeah, well, we was talking about how <laughs> Reggie's family life was so bad and all the trauma that he's experienced. 
nobody has access to that information unless you have signed a release of information. And again, we only share what is necessary. I'm working with you, one of the PMA, uh, BMH providers, Felicia. You familiar, Felicia? I love Felicia. That's my girl. <laughs> I assume so. Um, so me and Felicia are uh, at the school working with these students. Um, they're six to eight years old, and they wanted to kind of bring a version of like King's Corner, six to nine, a version mm -hmm. of like King's Corner, but for like the young boys and the young uh, ladies. Um, and we've been doing it for about a few weeks now, and we're noticing with the boys, they're a little more active, right? Mm -hmm. You spoke earlier about like the ADHD um, or ADD being diagnosed just strictly off of that, right? And I think the question that I'm asking is, Felicia didn't immediately jump to like, you know, like diagnosing them or whatever the case may be. She was like, but they do need more of a... Uh, Oh, man, I wish I got the clinical term, but they do need more of something that gives them like a fidget spinner or like a chair, um, yeah. it, like the, to like go in there. But they need more of something that can occupy that. Why do you think they're what's the where's the question that what's the they need the the coping skill versus, hey, they need to be diagnosed with something. You get what I mean? What's the delicate yeah. balance? Yeah. That? So the criteria. Right. Yes. So you. And my handy dandy <laughs> DSM right here. This is this is the like the small version, mm -hmm. the uh desktop version, but this is the the real the version, Bible. right? The Bible, man. They just came out with another one. I was like, y'all got me messed up. I'm not about <laughs> until I actually did it. I didn't have this in college. I ain't doing it. Um, but there are criteria based on this book that you must meet in order to um be diagnosed with um ADHD. And so people, again, you know, just misunderstanding what a diagnosis is, right? So people think that just because like a child can't sit down, you know, they and they bouncing from place to place and they bouncing off the walls and blah, 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 that, that means that like, oh, they have ADHD. If a parent feels like they can't control their child, they can't like, oh, my, like my, I had a, a client, um, this was when I was a, in my master's program and uh, doing practicum. Mom was like, he has ADHD. He can't focus. He can't sit still. He, he needs medication. Blah, 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 blah. And my other kids are, are not like that. And like they are able to do X, Y, and Z. And blah, blah, blah. my daughter is younger than him. She can, you know, get up in the morning and do her whole morning routine without any assistance and blah, blah, blah. And I'm like, okay, one, we got to recognize that each child is different. I was like, it's like different sports. They all got a ball. But there are different rules and requirements. Ooh, in order I like to win that it. analogy. Mm. Yes, I had to use that analogy with her because I was like, "How do I explain this?" And I'm like, "I was like, he's football, right? You got to throw the ball and make a touchdown and kick the drone or interception, whatever. I don't know. I'm not that big. Of a My husband will be so upset. Like, girl, we watch football all the time. I'm a football <laughs> player. You know these things. But like, there are different rules to that versus I was like, your daughter is basketball, right? It's a different type of ball. You still using your hands. But it's different rules. You got to, you know, bounce the ball and throw it through the hoop. You got two-pointer, three-pointer shots, free throws, you know, whatever. I'm like, and then your, your youngest kid, I'm like, he's soccer. You're not allowed to use your hands at all. You got to use your mm. feet and, like, maybe your shoulder or two and your head. And that's all you got. And you got to get a goal. I'm like, so it takes different things for each child. And you have to know your child enough to know what it is that they need. I was like, so yes, your daughter can. And I think that's just a society thing too, where it's like girls are trained to like do what is expected of you and like do that quickly. Like you picking up on stuff real fast and then you are able to be independent. With boys, some are able to gain the independence and some are just not. And it's like, it's not forced on them as much. Um, and so I'm like, you know, for him, you just need to be strategic about the way that you're doing things. He can't do three-step instructions. So then unfortunately you got to break your instructions down and give him one step at a time. All right. So, or he needs a visual, you know, um, situation. So he needs to see that like in the morning time, you're supposed to get up, make your bed, go in the bathroom and brush your teeth, wash your face, come back in your room, put your clothes on, put your shoes on. I'm like, and then also you got to reward the behavior that you want to see. 
like boys and I mean all children and all people we are we operate based on reward systems right we don't go to work if we ain't making money we ain't getting paid <laughs> if, if there's no payment I'm not showing up <laughs> like, what you I'm like because I'm like if you really thought about it none of us would be going and doing these 40 hour work weeks and working so 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 hard and dealing with the things we deal with if there was not a paycheck every two weeks mm-hmm. you wouldn't do it I'm like kids are the same way just because you provide them with a house and you give them clothes and you give them food, that is not a reward. Those are things you have to do if you don't want to go to prison. I'm just saying. But that would be neglect if you didn't do those things. So you have to do it. That is not a reward, right? But being able to take them to five below or, you know, give them an extra dessert or an extra snack or like one-on-one parent time or a tablet, an extra hour on a tablet or whatever, those are rewards for them. So you have to reward the behaviors that you want to see them do. And the more that you're rewarding the behaviors you want to see, the more they're going to engage in them. Kids just want attention. You, you, whatever attention is good attention. It doesn't matter if it's good or bad. So if you're yelling at them because they're not doing the things they're supposed to do, it don't matter. You're still giving them attention. So it's like you, but back to your original question, because I feel like I got that. Um, for some children, you just do like need to give them things like tangible things that will help them one get out the energy and help them to focus too. Mm-hmm. Um, but again, with ADHD, you have to meet criteria. So like again, it can't just be like you bouncing off the walls, but you're bouncing off the walls and you can't sit still at all. You might be um, you might have like an issue with like you're forgetting things. So you might be doing one task and then somebody might call your name and ask you to go do something. You go do it and then you don't forgot to come back to the task that you was doing before. And you done forgot completely. You, um, I can just pull it out. Cause why I gotta sit here <laughs> making my life hard. I mean, I know that I know these things, but like, <laughs> I don't have to do that to myself cause I don't do it anymore. Um, <laughs> So with the, and then there's two different types of, so ADD is no longer a thing. Okay. And they've combined um, it to create ADHD, which is attention deficit slash hyperactivity disorder. So you can, and there's three different types. So you can have inattentive type, um, hyperactive type, or combined type. So inattention means that like, you're not paying attention long enough. Like you will fail to give close attention to details. You're making careless mistakes in this lot, like, oh, you don't know what you're doing. It's like, no, you're just having a really hard time being able to focus on what it is that you're doing. Um, you're not listening when people are speaking directly to you. Um, you're not following through on instructions. You're having difficulty with organization. Um, you're avoiding a task that requires sustained mental attention, which is very important. So for a lot of children, um, like when you see them in class and they're like acting out, you're thinking like, oh, they're just bad. But like, no, that beh- there's a function to the behavior. That's getting them out of doing something that they do not want to do. Mm. And if they have an issue or they have difficulty with like sustaining their attention during the task, they're going to act out because they want to get away from doing that and do something preferred. Um, they're losing things that they need for the task. So like they might um, lose a pencil all the time, or they lose the eraser, they folder somewhere, they have no idea. Um, I just did an intake the other day, and the guy was like, yeah, when I was a kid, I remember, like, in school, um, I would bring home all the wrong work for homework every single time, and he was like, I don't know why I did it, but, like, I would always bring home the wrong workbook or the wrong, you know, worksheets or whatever, Um, And then the hyperactivity and the impulsivity is just what it sounds like. So like you have trouble sitting still. Um, You're going to run and like climb on stuff that you should not be climbing on. (laughs) Not able to pay attention even when you're doing like things that you like to do. Um, And learning out answers before a question is uh, finished. You have difficulty waiting your turn. You're interrupting people. Um, Impulsivity may also be that like you are like running into traffic. And it's like, you just, you just can't help but to just dart out there as a kid. And it's like, wait a minute, like, where are you going? Or you might be like running around the store, even though you're supposed to be standing next to your mom. It's like, I just, I can't help it. It just is what it is. And it's not, it's not a matter of like your child's bad or they can't, you know, they have no self-control, but it's like, just, they just 
are unable to do that. So you have to teach them and work with them on skills to improve their executive function because that's what ADHD is really about is like the word executive function. No, I love it. You spoke on something earlier that I don't want to forget because I want to make sure we tap into it. Um, like as a as a parent or as a provider, um, you feel like me me just providing is enough, you know, to to as a as a reward. So I'm thinking about those parents who they feel like providing is all they got, and yeah. it's almost offensive if I don't if providing is not enough, if that makes sense. <laughs> like if, if providing yeah. it, like that's, I, I'm doing the best that I can with what I have, but mm-hmm. that may not be all what the kid, the, the child needs. And yeah. and I think there's a, a gap in between the two because we feel like providing is enough. I don't know if yeah. that's a question, but it, please feel free to answer. It's, it's definitely a question, <laughs> definitely a question. Um, And I will apologize if anyone's seeing this feels offended by that because that is not, definitely not the intention. Um. And I, I definitely understand, you know, when providing is all that you got going on for what, you know, like you said, doing the best with what you got. Um, I've been there with my parents where they were, they were doing the best with what they had and that was all they could do. And so when we think of rewards, right, we always like to think of them in a monetary sense or a material sense. It don't even have to be that. Sometimes it could just be, like I said, a one-on-one, you know, experience with your parent one-on-one day you know an hour at the park and it's just us we might you know have a movie night together or watch my favorite tv show we might play a game together um you know we we have to get creative when the money is not there right um when we don't have the luxury of being able to take our kid to five below and be like all right you can pick out you know whatever toy you you want um and and if you can you know finesse even like a dollar. I mean, now the dollar tree that went up to a dollar twenty. That's not that's not what we're talking about right now. But if you could finesse a dollar and you know thirty something cent, because you know it's tax on it too. Um, if you could finesse that, you can even take them to the dollar store and be like, you know, let's get a coloring book. You know, let's let's get a book, and you know, we can have an extra hour of like reading tonight, or an extra hour of coloring if they have a tablet because their grandparent was just so gracious to purchase them one, or you were able to purchase them one. An extra hour for tablet time, an extra hour of TV. You know, this Friday night we could stay up a little bit later than usual. Um, you know, just again, you just gotta be creative and, and use what you do have. Um, to give them something because again children thrive off of attention that is what they want and they're going to do what they are little scientists they're going to do whatever it is that they can to get the attention that they need from you especially when you are a single parent or you even a you know two-parent household y'all are working your asses off to make sure that you can provide a, a life for them and you know keep them fed and keep them clothed and a shelter over their heads that's amazing. And I'm not asking you to do more than that. But the attention is what they're looking for. So if you can't, if you can't do things because of money, you can still give your kids attention. You, you can pull that out of you to make sure that you can give your kids even an, an hour of one-on-one time. Y'all would be amazed as to how much one hour of one-on-one time with your child could change a lot of things. Y'all could go for a lovely walk go to the park and y'all play together like what <laughs> that'd be the best little hour that you talk about that hour all week long they gonna go to school on monday like let me tell you how i'm out to me to the park mm-hmm. like it's it's possible it's possible but you gotta no. you know again finesse those ways it's true. I, uh, my, my wife just actually did that with my, my oldest son. And I got a question about the oldest child. But I don't want to forget, but um, just talking to him, um, he like cried and opened up because it was like you could tell how much he was yearning for, for one, him being the baby. I mean, the oldest and we have mm-hmm. a, a younger baby that just demands like attention. Um, he was like ha- actually happy with that, you know, full undivided attention. Um, because it, it, it got split after a while. And so I was like, oh, he needs his attention. Uh, even just even before we started recording this, it's supposed to be hot today, but it's like it's raining. And we was we said before the week started, like, hey, we, we'll go on Sunday 
to the park because it's going to be hot today but now it's raining and nobody feel like going out in the rain so now Mm -hmm. we have to find like an alternative way to compensate for that you know experience but going back to the oldest child um I told my my sister asked me a question um because she know I put the podcast clips out and she was like um uh, do you got any therapists you interviewing coming up? I would love to hear this question asked because of the clips that go out. And I was like, yeah, actually, Simone is coming up and I'll ask her this on um, when I talk to her. And she was talking about the experience of when you have the oldest child. Um, no one talks about that's like your your practice child almost with like you, you, you don't know what you're doing. You don't know because um, she's the oldest child. And mm-hmm. she has an older child. And then I, I'm the young, I'm the baby. So all I know is being the baby of it. Um, and she talked about how no one has empathy. I want to use that. And then she'll correct me if I'm wrong, but not really understanding like, yo, when you're dealing with the oldest child, that has a different level of dynamic because they get all the mistakes in this in, in, in a way. And you're also committing all of your mistakes on your oldest child because you don't know what you're doing at that point. She 100% right. She 100%. I am also the youngest child. Okay. <laughs> and like, when I say the youngest, so my siblings were all like old adolescents and adults by the time I came around. Mm. Um, my, I think there's a 14 year difference between me and like my youngest older brother. Mm. Um, and so, you know, and their experiences, all my siblings' experiences with my parents are vastly different than what I've had. Um, and she's 100% correct. And for the reasons that she stated, right? Like when you are the first child and a lot of times like you the first child of like a teenage mom or a really young mom and like the community of raising a child, like the village not really there like they should be or like they not giving you the, the most helpful advice. Like they mm-hmm. doing what they knew how to do. Um, and you are, as a first time parent, you doing what you know how to do. And those are the things that you saw worked for your parents. And so you're trying to make them work for you. And so, um, unfortunately, as the oldest child, you do get the, the brunt of that and you life feels like it's just so fucking unlivable because Mm -hmm. it's like damn like my parent is so hard on me there's like very strong expectations like you're supposed to be the best like you are the example for your siblings Mm -hmm. and there's a lot of responsibility placed on the older child um alfred adler uh is a psychologist um and he developed like the the theory or whatever of like that first child second child younger child thing um so if your sister is interested she can definitely look into him um he has a lot of great um information on you know just the different child experiences and like based on your your uh where you were born in the sequence of children like there are qualities that are going to be apparent to you Mm -hmm. um but there's there's a like a very heavy responsibility placed on older kids because like you the first one and again you the example for your younger siblings and like your parents feel like they have they have done the hardest part of like trying to create this like amazing child and once they have other kids it's like well damn I'm kind of broken from raising you to be the most amazing child so you show them how to be amazing kids too Mm. and then what the more kids that you have the more lax you become because then it's like again you tired like I don't I don't want to I don't want to do this with the third (laughs) child and the fourth child and all that stuff so then like as the youngest you're like yeah you're getting away with a whole bunch of stuff that your older sibling would have never even been able to do they wouldn't have had the chance and it's because, like, by the time you came along, your parents was tired or the responsibility has been placed on the older sibling, again, to teach the younger ones how to be and how to behave. Um, and so it's it's definitely unfortunate that that is the experience. But, yeah, she right. She right. And it's something that I encourage you know it's always important for people to go to therapy anyway but if you are an older child who feels like your life experiences have been colored in a like a a kind of negative way by that experience that's something for you to go to therapy for and kind of process because then you start to hold resentment towards your younger siblings because you feel like they had it easy 
because they were younger. And again, that responsibility was placed on the older kid and not on purpose, um, but the responsibility just gets placed on them to kind of help raise the younger generations and like, again, teach you to do what you're supposed to do and how to act because the parent is tired. <laughs> no, I, we, we were talking about that. And honestly, we actually, within the last two years, we filed, we're, uh, we're six years apart, five to six years apart. And we just realized we were always almost like against each other and mm-hmm. it was for no reason. And, and, and we, I even told her we can do something like this, like a podcast where it's like the golden child and the black sheep. And we just sharing like, you know, family experience and like just having conversation and breaking down certain dynamics, because what you said is so true where we were having resentment to each other for no reason. Uh, like, <laughs> and like it was just, I always had resentment to her. Cause I feel like she had our parents, our biological parents together. And I never had that. So you had a, a chance of five years before I was even born where you seen mom and dad, she always felt like, yo, you were the baby. So you got all the attention, like mom mm-hmm. and them gave you this. And I'm like, we just was just, you know, them dynamics, which are going back and forth against each other. And it was like, wait, you don't have that energy towards me. And I'm like, no. Nah. And, and and she was, and I was like, I don't got that energy towards you either. And so much communication gets lost because we don't mm-hmm. have these type of therapeutic conversations and not even sharing those different experiences. And I love how you said, if your uh, experience was colored in it, that's a good way to say that. If it was mm-hmm. colored in a negative way, we can go back and unpack that to some capacity. Yeah, yeah. And that's, that's important too, right? Of like, you know, you saying that, you know, I, I had some, a little bit of resentment for the fact that you got to see our parents together, but she holding on some resentment because you got all the attention. That's a really big thing for older kids too, because it's like, to go from being the person that had all of the attention to it's not that like you're ignored once a new baby comes but we get excited about new babies Mm -hmm. right like we love babies Mm -hmm. my brother has eight eight kids Mm -hmm. right eight children Mm -hmm. seven seven boys and a girl Mm -hmm. it's a lot of attention that gotta go around (laughs) that's a lot of attention and like when the girl finally came, I asked the the third oldest one. I said, "Scott, are you you excited about having a, a you know baby sister?" He was like, "No." And it's like he went from getting all the love, all the attention, to having all these little brothers and a new sister. And so now you got to split all that attention, and that's hard. And it's like, again, it's not that no, anybody's ignoring you purposefully, but it's like, you just get so excited with the new baby. And it's kind of like, like you, you go away. You and now like everybody yelling at you to go sit down somewhere. And mm-hmm. it's like, oh, look at the little baby. Go sit down somewhere. Look at the little baby. And it's like, I want attention too. And that's why kids start acting out because it's like, how the hell are you just going to push me to the side? You mm-hmm. love me no more. Um, and the more kids that come along, the less attention those older kids are getting. I remember taking um, in high school, I uh, took a law and psych class. And in the psych portion, we were talking about uh, this. And our teacher had gave us like um, advice. He was like, yeah, so if you ever are in a situation where like a new child comes into the picture and there are older s- siblings, he was like, if you bring a gift for the, the younger child, you also need to bring something for the older child or children. He was like, but the way he said, he was like, I mean, it don't got to be nothing crazy. Like you could give him like a stick of gum. I was like, I don't think a stick of gum is going to <laughs> is going to be like pacifying an older child. I'm pretty sure that they will want more. If I'm over here with this big old bag of goodies for a baby, and I'm like, here's a stick of gum. Here you go. Like no, but I make sure that you know when it's in my budget because as a student, you know, we want to strip mm. budget. When it's in my budget, if I got a gift for one and it's just like random it's not a special occasion like it's a birthday or something I gotta make sure that I got something for the the older ones too because I don't want them to feel left out I don't want them to feel like they're not important you got to be able to um to it's not going to be an equal amount of attention but you got to be able to parse out your attention and not just like forget the older child and be like, well, now because you're older, like the expectations for you are going to change or it's no longer cute what you're doing. Like, no, you need to behave and you need to do this and you need to do that. And again, that responsibility is placed on you to 
be somebody that you're not even supposed to be because you're a child with these adult expectations. Mm. And now everybody's focused on a baby, a baby, a baby. And it's like, you got to learn how to like be excited about the baby, but you also got to make sure you're including the older children or child too, because they still need the attention. They still need the love. And they didn't just magically turn into an adult because you had a new baby. Mm. Not how that works. All right, as we begin to close out, and uh, I feel like we, I did a little good job. Hey, what you think? Since I didn't have my notes from my phone. I did a fabulous job. <laughs> a fabulous job, honey. Because listen, you know how many times as a therapist, I forgot my little notes. And I'm like, well, we're just going to do this on the fly. And it turned yeah. out to be one of the best sessions you could ever have. <laughs> Prepare yourself, because as a therapist, upcoming therapist you go ahead those times where you're like dang where my little notebook oh i forgot it and you're gonna have to go based off what you remember that's it and, and it, i tell you it'd be the best sessions ever like mm. ever. so with what going back to how we started off newlywed right where it does I always say I always got to ask this question it's obviously for personal reasons anytime I talk to therapists I tell the listeners they're going to charge for this tomorrow so I try to get my <laughs> session into now so <laughs> how do you turn the Simone the therapist off and turn Simone the wife on what's the delicate balance of that are we still trying to figure that out um <laughs> it's it's really hard because like in so many different capacities I am like Simone the therapist and Simone developing that Simone the clinical psychologist I'm literally going Monday through Saturday doing this work in various capacities um and so that can be hard sometimes but I will say that I'm very good and I got very good at this after my master's degree of like I don't work for free no more Mm. I do do two practicums right now, which requires me to work for free, but eventually the payout is going to be there. But I don't work for free anymore. And I am also, I'm not a therapist in my relationship. I'm a therapist for work and work only. Will I be able to utilize my therapy skills to help in any way, shape, or form? Yes. I'm just a natural problem solver. So like, I'm immediately going to go to that. But I have been learning as a wife of like, just, um, just listening, right? Uh, and asking like, is, is it that you're looking for like a problem solving or you need a solution or you just want to like vent to me about this? Um, and uh, it's so hard because it's just like, because uh, I when I like stopped being therapist and all, I just kind of like shut down all the <laughs> because <laughs> it's a big part of you <laughs> exactly i just like all right and sing like that's it. and i just quiet let's not but um i think that i'm just like a cool calm collective type of individual like i am a jokester i think i'm like a comedian of some kind um and i just be my regular regular self like my regular regular self comes through in my and my therapy as well, like a good mixture of professional and like cool Simone, funny Simone. Um, but I just, I don't work for free no more. So mm -hmm. and he ain't getting it for free either. So <laughs> <laughs> if you want these good skills, you're going to have to pay the fees. And after next year, the fee will be up to $200. Yesterday's um, price is not today's price. <laughs> it really is not. After I got that second master, I was like, baby, the price is increasing. And I just, I can't do it for free. Like people always ask me, are you analyzing me? Hell no. <laughs> do you have analyzing you money? Cause I don't do that for free. Like that's, it's a lot of work. It's a lot of mental work to like, listen to people all day, take it in, make all these connections to how it connects to your past and why this is happening now. And then like ask a bunch of questions and help you formulate some conceptualization and understanding of yourself. I'm not trying to do that with nobody else for free. Oh God, no. And after I get off work, I don't want to do anything else. And so um, I just, you know, just recognizing that, like, I got to make sure that I'm asking, like, are you looking for a solution? Or are you, you just venting? Let me know. And then we'll work it through. And, you know, my skills are just going to come across naturally because I've honed them so much that it's just part of me. But I try not to push that on and compartmentalize as much as I can. I had one question left, but you just you opened up another one. So I, I please try to answer it as fast as possible. I can squeeze okay. the last one. The last one in is about uh, wellness. Like, what is your overall meaning of wellness? So you can think about that as I ask this one. What is that delicate balance of uh, 
someone venting versus looking for advice. What what do you look for with that? Because I uh, I still struggle with that. I'm thinking like, all right, how I can solve as in my relationship. But when someone calls me, I'm like, all right, solution, solution, solution. But sometimes people call saying they're looking for or seeming like they're looking for solution, but they're actually venting. How do you decipher between that? Um, by literally just asking, are you are you looking for a solution or you want to vent? Because I can't, I am not a psychic, so I don't know. I got to ask you and just be very specific. What are you looking to do? Because naturally, I'm going to jump into problem solving because that's what I do. And I've been doing that for a very long time, for most of my life. And so I just had to ask you, what is it that you want? Um, because for some people, like you said, when they're venting, it sounds like they want to solve the problem. And sometimes even if you don't ask and you start trying to like give them like, oh, well, you could do this or you could do that. And they... And yeah, well, I don't really. I don't really think that's gonna work. Or mm, right, that, like, that let me know right there. Oh, you just want to talk about it then. You not you're not calling to be about it. You just want to talk about it and get it off your chest. That's cool with me too. And and you will get it. Mm-hmm, yep. Yeah. That's cool. Okay. Yeah. All right. Yeah. I support you. I, I'm so sorry that that happened to me. And you know, and keep it moving. But definitely listen for those that apprehension of like, mm, I, mm, I don't know if I could do that. All right. Okay, you just want to talk, just talk. Mm. But definitely just ask you. Wellness, what does wellness mean to you? Um, Wellness means that you are able to manage everything that you have going on um, in a way that does not interfere with your ability to function. Beautiful close out. <laughs> <laughs> Beautiful close out. On that note, I will put Simone's information in the description, the bio. Y'all will see her uh, IG handle on there so you can kind of stay connected and follow the good, great work that she is doing. Um, and remember that this platform has never been about being a replacement to therapy. It's an alternative place where people share therapeutic stories. Thank you for listening.